From an ACLS standpoint, the approach to the bradycardic patient differs slightly from that of the approach to the tachycardic patient. In bradycardic patients, the main branch point is determining whether or not the patient is stable versus unstable. As with the ACLS tachycardia algorithm, we're assuming the patient has a pulse and we're assuming in this, at this point that you've already assessed your circulation, airway, and breathing. Because if the patient was bradycardic without a pulse, they would fall under the PEA algorithm of ACLS. The mentality with bradycardic patients is that they're more unstable than your typical patient, and everything you do is a temporizing measure to buy you some time until the patient can get definitive treatment. Stable patients get monitored, and in rare cases of very severe stable bradycardia, uh, we might even trial at atropine. Um, whereas unstable patients um, eventually get electricity, uh, but they may also get some medicine. As with tachycardia, let's define what makes an unstable patient. It's those four things we talked about, with all of them being signs of end-organ dysfunction. Altered mental status is end-organ dysfunction of the neurologic system. Hypotension is end-organ dysfunction of the circulatory system. Chest pain is end-organ dysfunction of the cardiovascular system. And acute CHF or flash pulmonary edema. If the patient is not exhibiting any of these four signs, then you can confidently approach them as a stable bradycardic patient. Stable bradycardic patients still receive close monitoring because, as we mentioned before, they may quickly deteriorate and become unstable. So you want to make sure that the crash cart is at bedside, the pacing pads are on the patient, and that you have atropine at the bedside, ready to go. In these patients, we have time to figure out why are they bradycardic. So you can start your workup with your EKG to evaluate for heart block or um, find any secondary findings suggestive of hyperkalemia or digoxin toxicity. You also have time to get labs and figure out um, if they actually are hyperkalemic or if there's some other electrolyte abnormality. You have time to review the patient's medications to see if they're on a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker. You can also evaluate to see if they have an increase in their heart rate as a compensatory response to um, increased activity in the ER. If you determine your patient is unstable, then like everything else in emergency medicine, you escalate and de-escalate as needed after you determine how stable the patient is. If you've determined that your patient is unstable, then you have to escalate the situation and then de-escalate as you've gathered more information and figure out how unstable or stable your patient is. As I mentioned before, it's important to make sure you do your CAB, circulation, airway, and breathing, but in this scenario, we've already assumed that that is present, so you go on to the next step. This is where you want to get more helpers, so you alert your ancillary staff that this is a rapid response situation. You get the crash cart at bedside and place the pacer pads. You call out for atropine and make sure you have it ready to go as they're awaiting IV access. Knowing that there's a high likelihood that atropine may not work, especially in second degree to third degree heart block or people with a history of heart transplant, you are also asking for epi or dopamine drips. And you're working your way down to electricity from the medicines, uh, basically transcutaneous, and if that doesn't work, transvenous pacing. And while it looks like there's a list and a sequential order here, all of this may be happening simultaneously or near, near simultaneously. And that all depends on how unstable your patient is. If he's otherwise mentating with a soft blood pressure in the high 90s systolic, then maybe you have a little bit more time than the patient with acute pulmonary edema, altered mental status, who you may need to intubate, and uh, you see their pressures are dropping very rapidly. That person you may just jump quickly to pacing and then try to start some medicines. And while this is all going on, you should always be asking yourself, why? Why is this patient bradycardic? Are they bradycardic from an inferior or right-sided MI? 
Do they have second degree or third degree heart block? You examine the patient to see if they have any stigmata of end stage renal disease or fistulas or a tunnel cath that might suggest hyperkalemia. You look at the EKG to see if there is a junctional rhythm or peaked T waves or widened QRS. You delegate the task of looking to see what medications the patient is on and maybe it's a calcium channel blocker toxicity or a beta blocker toxicity situation or a digtox. And the reason you're doing this all at the same time is because you're always thinking that you are just there to bridge the patient to a definitive treatment. Starting these medications, the transcutaneous pacing, transvenous pacing is only a means to an end. And if you don't know what the underlying cause is, you may not be able to help the patient um, and the patient may become unstable uh, very quickly in the emergency room. For example, if you know that this patient is in third degree heart block, then you need to get them to the cath lab to put that permanent pacemaker in. Or if they're hyperkalemic, ultimately you need to get them to hemodialysis emergently. Or if you're dealing with one of these toxic states, then you may need to do lipid emulsion therapy or a high dose insulin therapy or maybe even digibind. These patients can be very scary, but as long as you develop an organized protocolized approach, you will not be scared the next time you see a bradycardic patient.